We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Nothing Personal on March 28th, 1980. It was written by Robert Kaufman, directed by George Bloomfield, and released by American International Pictures, who also released Mad Max and Defiance. And as much as I love Mad Max, I'm glad they're gone. Um... <laughs> In his review of this film, Ebert accused it of being a Canadian tax haven, (laughs) which required a certain percentage of the cast to be Canadian actors. Okay. uh, Explaining Donald Sutherland's presence, uh, as well as a few other people. Well, I liked the, I think this was the TV Guide review of it. It's a good example of how a deal gets made and a picture doesn't. Nothing Personal is a Canadian tax shelter manufactured to take advantage of the concessions north of the border with several Canadian featured players. This uh, this was Sommer's first major film role after a successful television career, and she almost didn't recover from this disaster. Right, she didn't do another film until 94 yeah, for yeah. Serial Mom. So, some pretty rough reviews on this one. Uh, the opening credits say original music by Peter Mann. I do not like the music here. Yeah. Um, but I like Peter Mann, which is what um, Ron Livingston's neighbor calls him in office space. <laughs> hey, Peter Mann! <laughs> um, when, when this started uh, showing footage of seals, I, my first note was, oh, God, is this going to be about clubbing seals? Uh, oh, yes. No, 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 not at all. That would, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a riotous romantic comedy. Yeah. Oh, it's also, actually, it's in the Guinness World Record. It's the first riotous romantic comedy with actual footage of baby seals being clubbed. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. There was, and when we say actual footage, like, they were definitely some shots where they were, like, fake hitting, like, stuffed things. Yeah. There was shots where they were actually moving seals in them, and there yeah. were people with, like, clubs and stuff. I think some baby seals got harmed in the making of this film. Yeah. Well, as far as I know, that the warning that no animals were harmed in the making of this film, they started that in 83 um, with... Uh, octopusy because they jumped that horse off of a castle oh yeah yeah and uh that was the first movie to feature that warning i think that was one of the trivia well technically no animals were ever making of this film because that film was already made right <laughs> and at the time uh oh, they just used actual footage yeah of baby seals getting close. like who took that footage where did that footage come it's instructional from? this is how you do it <laughs> also there was a some coal company uh, had a law declare that baby seals are technically plants, so you can club them all you want. It's totally fine. Um, that's not true. What are you talking about? You crazy <laughs> it just man. seems like weird laws that happen. Like tomatoes are botanically fruits, but they're legally vegetables. Like one of those things for where, shipping like, purposes. Ducks can't wear pants in Florida. They actually finally repealed that. <laughs> Thank God. We open the film with a pointless like millennial lecture talking about kids these days and how they're terrible yeah um, uh we also get like maybe a mash reference oh yes the signs you mentioned oh, yes. it. you yeah. mentioned it when we were watching it you're like is this a mash reference and i'm yeah. like no that was just oh wait that was 10 years ago yeah okay it could be <laughs> yeah there's there's one of those signs out in front of the university pointing in every direction and saying how many thousands of miles away all these major cities are yeah but back inside the building we're in like some faculty room where a couple of professors are talking donald sutherland is just smoking up a joint what are you smoking that shit for for christ's sakes it's how i prepare for my classes while these other professors are talking to him and this one is just going a mile a minute on this lecture about how activists these days are a waste of time and if, it sounds like he's specifically ripping on the cast of A Small Circle of Friends. Yeah, it was really kind of like coming <laughs> off of that movie. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, this is the screenwriter giving this oh, lecture. The, ran- yeah, the, the ranter is the screenwriter? Yeah. Yikes. Uh, we move to the classroom where Peter, a regular problem student and proficient sweater, um, <laughs> brings up that baby seals are being clubbed to death very nearby. Is that why he looks wet? 
You think he's just sweating? He looks soaking wet. Do you think he was swimming to get photographs of the know. seals? Yeah. I was like, where where are they? Are they? They're, I think they're, they're in, Alaska. in Alaska. They are in Alaska. Yeah, they're yeah. in Alaska. I was never certain where the heck they were. Yeah. And where they I were. I think getting... that's the point of the sign at the beginning. Like, mm-hmm. look, we're really far away from everything. We're in Alaska. This is how far stuff is. Yeah. Because they. Because I, I was. We reading... live here on a dare. Yeah. Welcome to Alaska. I, I can't remember where I was reading. Uh, because I was doing re- when I was doing my research, someone mentioned his home state of Alaska. It was like. Was he, he was just from Alaska. Like, he didn't didn't, didn't take place in no, Alaska. This is, this yeah, his, the school that he's at is in Alaska. Um, but yeah, this kid shows up and he's just dripping wet. Maybe because he was swimming around getting footage of people beating baby seals. I'm not sure. But uh, he says, They are killing seals out in Dawson Bay. <laughs> and he says, so, Well, you know, they're allowed to do that. And he says, No, they're not. These are endangered seals. He says, okay, well, if you have proof, then you can take them to court. And he's like, oh, I have proof. And then it just cuts to the next day, Donald Sutherland finds a dead baby seal on his front porch. And he's yeah. like, yeah. oh, Peter, what? Yeah, this is, ugh. This movie is not fun or enjoyable in any way. I did not need to see a bloody seal on somebody's doorstep in yeah. this, you know, jaunty romantic comedy. Yeah, it's- and- and this is where I wrote my note. Oh God, it is about clubbing <laughs> seals. Yeah, <laughs> the, the the horrible realization that I was right. Yeah, Ugh. I was making a bad joke, and I was right. Yeah. So he uh, he goes back to the school where Peter is actually screening footage, and this is where we get actual footage of people clubbing either dead or fake seals, and then footage of someone taking basically a crowbar to a live seal. Yeah, this was yeah. horrifying to me. I can't believe they actually showed this footage. That was totally a real seal yes. getting hit with like a crowbar. Yeah. And I mean, not hard enough to kill it. Like, it, And it could have been a, a rubber or styrofoam crowbar, but this looked to me like real footage of a yeah. seal getting clubbed in a comedy. And not a lot of romantic comedies will survive this scene. This one doesn't. <laughs> Uh, a surprise appearance by uh, Catherine O'Hara. Yeah, Catherine O'Hara as Audrey. I don't think anyone says her name, but she's credited as Audrey. Yeah, is it, but I was like, also, was, does she even have a line? Uh, she says a little bit, like, it's like, can we do anything to stop this or something? Yeah, she like has that? to have a line because she's Canadian and they're trying to get that money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but I was like, is that Catherine O'Hara? Yeah. <laughs> nope. Uh, the professor goes to talk to the dean and he's like, hey, they're clubbing baby seals and that's illegal. And the dean's like, I'm a dean and you're a professor. Why are you telling me about this? And then he says, no, that's not what he says. He says, go to Washington. I'll pay for it. You can go to Washington and tell them that they're clubbing yeah, baby seals. Makes Why? No sense. Why is that the professor's job? Isn't there I a mean, phone call we can make? I think he's a law professor, but... But he's not a legislator. Like, Yeah. I don't know why the school would think this is a good idea to pay for this trip. This is also Alaska, apparently. So I guess maybe the rules are different. Yeah. For that in uh, Alaska, everyone is a cop. State. They have to deputize the entire state. But also, uh, in addition to sending him to Washington to solve this problem, he also wants him to go to like Canton or Akron or somewhere yeah. to like complain to some razor company that he can't get his razors out of the box. On one condition, you stop off in Canton, Ohio, on your way back here, and get these dirty bastards too. Yeah, I thought he was joking about that, but then they bring it up again later yeah. as if, yeah, he's not joking. Yeah. Um, but uh, so the professor takes a per diem and money for a flight and goes to Washington and stays at the Dulcie House, which is um, a small hotel in Washington, D.C., run by a fellow history buff mm-hmm. who uh, squares off with Donald Sutherland when he's checking into the hotel, like sharing constitutional trivia he tells him, oh, well, you're, you should stay in room number four. That's our special room. It has a good view of the Jefferson Monument, and that's where George Wallace stayed. I have to say, Paxton is my favorite character in this movie. Yeah. Just, no, just because of who everyone else is. Yeah. <laughs> he's not particularly great. Uh, but when he when Sutherland first walks in, he's like, Hi, I'm a professor. And he's like, oh, that's great. I need a word that starts with L and ends with S and is 10 letters long that means talkative. And he's like, oh, loquacious. And he's like, now I need a nine letter. He's like, can I just check into the hotel, please? <laughs> but uh, we get pretty terrible aerial stock footage. Uh, we have aerial footage of the Pentagon with a big yeah. scratch in it. Yeah, it's 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 easily footage that seems like it's 20, 30 years old. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, feel, I was thinking feels 50s. straight out of the 50s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, but speaking of footage feeling old... 
this like this whole movie feels older than 1980 to me. I the reason for that I would say is in addition to being a bad director, he shot everything like they were on a soap opera, and so uh, it's like a very uncharacteristic uh, cinematography and camera work. Everyone's dressed up like they're in a photo shoot. Mm-hmm. No one's dressed up like how people dress. I wonder if it wasn't also shelved for a while. I think this was actually rushed out. I don't I don't think they sat on this because no? Suzanne Summers was huge because of Three's Company at the time. And they were like, we need to get her in theaters right away and take advantage of this on a, on a, the box office level. Because all we're getting right now is advertising money. Because yeah, I think they say the year 1979 at least once or twice. <laughs> we'll get into that. Because that, there's um, there were a couple moments in this where... I turned it off and was going to call you and say, don't watch this movie. We're done. We're not going to review this one. Unfortunately, you had already watched the movie and we felt so guilty about having made you watch such a terrible movie that we we turned it back on and we finished it. But they just kept saying things that would make me angrier and angrier. And we'll get into that. Um, But it just, nobody cared about this movie. They, They did it very, very quickly and it shows in a lot of places. But so he goes to meet with the military. For some reason, this professor is granted a meeting with like the air the, force, the, the brass of the of the military and the air force, and they're showing him like top, top secret, secret classified <laughs> satellite photography of China. And they're saying, "Well, we got to worry about ICBMs from China." He's like, "I think you mean Russia." And he said, "No, China. Look at this dot, the tiny black dot there in the lower left hand corner." Wait. I'll magnify it 50 times. Oh, now it's a bigger dot. Yeah, those are ICBMs, or it will be in two years. See, I thought I felt like they were trying to be really like satirical or yeah. comedic. But there's with, nothing funny about it. It wasn't yeah. funny. Yeah. And, and it's like, oh, the joke is that he's not getting any more information by zooming in on the black dot. And it's mm-hmm. like, okay, but is that funny? Just zooming in on the dot? N- no, I agree that it isn't funny, but I, I I also think that they were trying to be funny. Right? Oh, no, yeah, I yeah, agree. Yeah. I think this I movie is trying to do a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> What's funny is that it's not funny. <laughs> What's funny is how often it fails. What's funny is that we're still reviewing it. Yes, Roger goes to meet with a senator that he knows like yeah. firsthand, and he just and... but just calls him senator. Yeah, we never even he's he's even just credited as senator. Right, but he I think he's a senator from Alaska. Um, Makes sense. And uh, because he says something like, oh, they're building this thing and they're going to get rid of all these uh, all these seals. And then he says, well, they're, they're also bringing 10,000 jobs to the area. Mm-hmm. And if I try to shut it down, then the Republicans are going to hand me my walking papers at the next election because I prevented them from killing all these seals. And, and, and by the time you get someone to even notice you, the seals are all going to be dead. Right, because there was... At the beginning of the film, we get a population of about a thousand, and by the time he's giving his presentation to the stockholders, it's down to like three hundred. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so Roger, in speaking to the senator, embarrasses himself multiple times by just saying, "Oh, but China, China's our friend. Like China's great. We love China." Mm-hmm. And it's like, who knows more about our relationship with China, a senator or just a random professor? Are we selling this film to China? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then the senator says, You look just like Shirley MacLaine when you said that. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe that yeah. made more sense at the time. Or he's just saying like, oh, how naive of you to just assume that China is our friend. Or... But even Donald Sutherland goes, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, his, his, he doesn't his... even get the reference in his own movie. But Donald Sutherland is a wonderful man and a great actor. And he's not trying in this movie at all. He's literally just delivering every line with the same... Like nothing, no flair, no any interesting yeah. delivery. He's just he's just here to click those sweet, sweet Canadian loons. Yeah, he's just doing <laughs> he's doing the table read on set. He's not acting, and uh, he goes back to the hotel. He calls Paxton because his tub is leaking, and Paxton's like, "Right away." I thought you'd never ask. And then he goes up to the room, and we're like, "Oh God, what is what happening?" Is happening? <laughs> I was. This is the part got me really happy. Yeah. I was like, oh my. Um, yeah. So Paxton walks in holding a big list. And he's like, oh, you already have some names? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, well, just call whoever you think is the best. And he's like, you don't have like a regular person? And he's like, why would I have a regular lawyer? lawyer. And he's like, no, I, I need a plumber. I don't need a lawyer. The, the tub is overflowing. He's like, 
I wrote a note and I hid it in the medicine cabinet. You didn't read it? And I was like, no, I don't bring medicine to hotels. <laughs> He's like, I wasn't sick. I was dirty. <laughs> yeah. And the, so the tub is overflowing and there was a note not to use it, I guess. Or, or to use it in some specific way that it yeah, wouldn't overflow. Yeah, I'm not overflow. entirely sure what the note was for. Yeah. it was. I rented you the best room in the house. It, the tub doesn't work. And the whole bathroom's broken. That's the best room we have. So <laughs> just be happy you're not in the other rooms. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he has a list of lawyers because he knows what's going on and he knows... Because uh, he was listening in he, on his phone yeah. calls. Um, well, that's what... That's, hey, there aren't a lot of perks to having to run a hotel, but being able to listen in on the switchboard is definitely one of them. Right. But also, in addition to knowing a lot about uh, the Constitution, he also has some family that are trying to be lawyers now and... It seems like they're setting him up to, like, know a lot about the law and be helpful. But this list he has sucks. Yeah. Uh, The lawyers are all taken or they're lawyers in a different type of law. Divorce, tax, rape. Yeah. And was like, if I plan on raping someone, they're going to help me. Yeah. It's like, help you? Yeah. If you rape someone, isn't it? Shouldn't it be the other way around? No. There's there's plenty of attorneys that specialize in helping people get away with rape. You never heard those radio commercials where they're like... Like, oh, are you are you driving really drunk? Well, don't tell the cops that. Tell me. And it's like, this, this person is terrible. I can't believe you could buy an ad like this on the radio. It's like, I get that some people need attorneys for, like, DUI situations. Don't presume the guilt of the person in the radio ad. At yeah. least pretend that you're defending an innocent person. Well, and here he's even saying, if I plan to rape someone. Not, yeah. not if it just happens in the spur of the moment but if i've gone out and planned it i'll make sure i get my lawyer ahead of time yeah that's that's rape one right isn't that it's like murder if it's premeditated i don't know but yeah he goes to the yellow pages instead because this list of lawyers is terrible and i don't know where this guy got it and he goes to a adams the very first name in the list and they're trying to keep their dumb political jargon going and so this a adams literally stands for abigail adams which is pretty famously the wife of the second president of the united states right right and uh, he goes to meet with her to be his attorney but thought that there was a different a adams there he didn't even ask who a adams was when he called the office to yeah. make the appointment um and so when he gets in she's like well uh i'm the attorney and he's like wait no but but you have booby parts you're the attorney yeah see no and he's like so thrown back that it's just like Okay, well, I hate this character. Which one am I supposed to like? <laughs> because this person's obnoxious. And... Look, and he says that it's something about you being a woman. It's like, I think 100% in your mind, that it is, is about what it... that. Yeah, you, you blatantly said that. You're like, where is he? Oh, it's you? Oh, okay, never mind then. Um, yes, you can help me. Get me the yellow pages, please. And she's like, you're not even going to give me a chance? And uh, and she, you know, she reads off all of her... She, she went to Harvard Law. She graduated magna cum laude. Like, she's... She's completely qualified, and she has plenty of time because no one will hire her because she's a woman. And uh, he decides that he's going to try other attorneys in the Yellow Pages, and he's literally just going in alphabetical order, which she predicts because he came to her first. And so she decides she's going to intercept him, and she can skip a few names that she knows aren't going to be helpful to him. And so he meets her at, like, the third uh, attorney's office that he goes to, and she's like, well, I knew you would go to this place and this place and this place first and they would all not be helpful. Mm -hmm. So I met you here. And she's trying to show how like savvy she is and how she can predict things and stay a few steps ahead of everybody. She lets him know that Dunbar Construction is very sensitive about PR, that they've canceled $3 million in ads during a detective show because the PTA said that uh, it was too violent. And, uh, and he's like, okay, fine. You, you want me to hire you then? Like, what's what's going on? She's like, well, I also know that you don't have any money, but I want you to tell people that you paid me $25,000 because she needs to have... An image. Yeah, an image, and she wants a reputation of having been paid by someone. So here she's begging to work for free mm-hmm. for this guy. And after he hires her for no money, which is the same as what was going on before this conversation happened... She elaborates that Dunbar also funded Nixon's re-election and they recently fired a gay vice president who, in the middle of a flight, got up and admitted that he had a relationship with someone else that worked at the company or something. It doesn't play any part in the future of the film. It's just like, I have embarrassing information about this company and we can share it 
And it's like, wait, I was hiring you as an attorney to stop them from clubbing baby seals, right? Wasn't that what? Wasn't that why I was looking for an attorney? I forget why I was looking for an attorney because we never file a lawsuit or anything, and we never do anything that attorneys do. We're just pretending yeah. we're two PIs trying to solve a mystery. Even when attempted murder occurs, we don't yeah. do anything. Yeah. Um, so they decide they're going to head to a stockholder meeting in Philadelphia, which is where this company is headed. In the cab, on the way to the stockholder meeting, he says, well, shouldn't we pack some clothes? And she says, oh, I don't need any. And he's like, well, what about undergarments? And she's like... <sighs> Roger, this is 1979. 1979? You don't change your under things. No, I mean, I don't wear any. And he's so, like, flabbergasted by that mm-hmm. that he can't talk to her anymore. Then on the train, while they're heading to the stockholder meeting, he's sitting down and writing the lecture that he's going to give. Because he's a professor, so he just writes lectures. And he's literally just going to lecture people to stop right. doing this. <laughs> he doesn't want to give them any financial motivation to stop clubbing seals or legal injunction he just wants to say stop it for a really long time so he's writing stop it over and over again on yellow legal paper and then abby abigail says oh i have an ex in philly also i'm extremely horny right now sitting next to you what's that supposed to mean it means i just got horny sitting next to you it's a train and he doesn't react to this line read at all because it comes out of nowhere and makes no sense and he's just basically says like, "Oh, it's the train." Like, it's not weird that you said that, but mm-hmm. uh, it's the train. You're not you're not actually horny for me. We we already covered that she wants to be taken seriously as a female attorney, yeah. and the first thing she does is tell her client, "Oh, by the way, I don't wear underwear, and I'm super horny for you right now." This is incredibly infuriating. Yeah, <laughs> I, <laughs> she's I, I, awful. I feel, I feel like you're having to, to chime in here because I'm just la- sitting back here like rolling my eyes at this <laughs> film. I'm just like, I cannot believe... I don't know. what. The, why did this movie get made? How did this movie get made? Dabney presents the plan to them. Dabney Coleman is playing uh, sort of an assistant to the head of the company. Yeah, he seems to be very important. He's even got like a like an office off of his office. Right. Like, like he's that's how close he needs to be. Yeah, he has his own secretary. But he is telling them the whole plan for, oh, after we kill all the SEALs, we're going to build this whole community up there. And it basically, like, they're pretending it's for national security, but really it's just to build a community that yeah, and, they can charge a lot for. And again, this is in Alaska, right? You know, where the home prices must be high. Well, he Wait, says no. that the homes no, that are not. in this community, the homes are selling for fifty to $75,000. Right, which but then he implies that they're they're you know th- that that's high enough to keep out right. the riffraff. You know, yeah. we wouldn't want any poor people or you know ethnic yeah, people in this area. He's showing them where all the schools are because they're obviously a man and a woman, so they yeah. plan on having children. And he says these are the two elementary schools. We kept them close together because uh, we didn't want any uncomfortable busing issues, but we think the house pricing will prevent that in the, in the first place. So, well, so they're making a track so that we can at least put some people on the other side of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> But also, uh, he says this is going to be the largest shopping center in America. In, in a, Alaska? In a small town in Alaska. Which, it, clearly, there's nothing there right now because it's just a bunch of seals breeding. So, yeah. they're building a small community with the largest shopping mall in so, America. So, I mean, I don't know if, you, if I should say this. Where we live, there is a major outlet shopping center. Right. It's a big deal. And people do travel here from three or four cities over but we live in a city here. that's over a hundred thousand people yeah and so i get that i get it and it's not even the largest it's just a large one but there's lots of people in the area to come to it i'm sorry alaska you are not as pop densely as populated of state yeah and I'm assuming that this is more in the southern portions towards Juneau. Yeah, and it's on the coast. Yeah, it's in that little like leg that shoots down off yeah. the bottom of Alaska. So where are all these people going to come from? They're all the people shop? that built the thing. It's going to be like a, a Martian <laughs> expedition where it's like the only people that live there are the people who built it because they have to repopulate Alaska. <laughs> um, it's like that shopping center they opened up in, in Simi Valley, the, the big new one. Yeah, yeah. And it's completely falling apart. And all the stores are pulling out. Because there's not enough people there That's to support. That's happening at the Mall of America, too. All the st- all oh, the, I bet. They're losing a lot of their, their people that 
that had stores there for decades. Well, also, we've got a little bit away from consumerism here. And, you know, people aren't going to malls. Well, at yeah, least brick and, mor- brick and mortar consumerism yeah. is going away. So yeah, people the only aren't reason going the malls, malls are still there is because they're covering the missile silos. It's <laughs> the only reason that we keep them around. <laughs> or or secret Russian well, uh, underground bases. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like that line in Bridesmaids, though, when Melissa McCarthy, like, when they're all on, like, the... They're all on the, the group phone call. And every time they show Melissa McCarthy, like there's like a war room map behind her with like a bunch of flashing lights on it. And I was like cracking up like that was such a hilarious joke that whatever she's doing, that's behind her. And then later on, they explain that she works for Homeland Security. And she's like, oh, yeah, I know where all the nukes are. A lot of malls. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So uh, Dabney gives them this whole presentation, assuming that they're man and wife. And then right in the middle of it, don't you think it's weird that he's giving this presentation? Like, he seems like the right-hand man of this yeah. company. Mm-hmm. Why would, like, the vice president of this company be giving... To a guy like, who owns one share of stock? One share... Well, not only does he own just one share of stock, but maybe they, this this couple is interested in buying one house. But apparently they're so desperate, I guess, to get people in this community that he'll mm-hmm. spend, you know, an hour of his time explaining this whole community to them. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. It's it's just as weird as the fact that the professor can just walk up to a senator or to the head of the Air Force and ask for information, and they're just, like, completely obliging. But uh, apparently they went in and they were like, I'm a stockholder. Tell me about your homes. And he's like, right away, let me get you the, the, the second-in-command to give you the full lecture about what's going on. But instead of continuing with the ruse... For no reason, Donald Sutherland just suddenly blurts out, You must stop killing the Chihuahua seals in Dawson Bay. And he's like, what are you talking about? And he's like, you're killing a bunch of baby seals in the area where the, you're building this. He's like, are you, you talking about this this place that we're... There? I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, yeah. I've never heard anything about this. And uh, they, they're in like a bar. They move to a bar at the yeah. bottom of the hotel. And while they're in the bar, like they get a couple drinks and they have more of an argument and Dabney's like, look, I can't, I can't believe that this is happening. I didn't know anything about it. We'll find some humane way to kill all these seals. <laughs> and then Donald Sutherland just assaults him in the bar in front of all these people. Understand, it's not how they're killed that matters. It's that they're being not killed at all, so you dumb witnesses. bastard. It doesn't matter. i got to make this asshole understand. You- and he freaks out on him. Um, and they're, like, escorted out of the room. That night, Abby strips completely naked, pulls a blanket over her feet... Puts a pillow over her boobs and um, tells Donald Sutherland to come into the room so that he can give her paperwork for what their plan is for the next day. Once again, so incredibly infuriating. It's like, I really want you to take me seriously. So I'm just going to invite you in my room while I'm naked. Right. Um, And then she acts like he's the prude for being like, why are you suddenly completely naked? Like if he'd have been like, Hey, can you bring me my briefcase? And she came in and he just had a sock on his junk. And he was like, Mm -hmm. what's so weird about this? (laughs) Why are you being weird? Come over and touch my junk. But um, she she just acts like it's totally normal what she's doing. And she says, I'd come over and get the paperwork from you. Oh, I can't do that. I tied my ankles together with a pair of shoelaces. Oh, yeah? Well, you see, it's a promise I made to my mother when I left home. You know, in case some insane rapist should break through the door and want to have his way with me. And the shoelaces will prevent that, eh? Unless he decides to turn me over. Which is the first of four crudely shoved into her mouth butt sex jokes. Yeah. Over the course of this movie. It keeps happening. And I don't know why. <laughs> it happens so many times. But this is the first one. Um, I love that we have a tally. Yes. Uh, Roger tells her that uh, what she needs to learn, because she's such a dummy is that her pussy is not the most important part of her. Uh, it doesn't define her, even though it's the reason that he wasn't going to hire her as an attorney. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has nothing to do with her except for her ability to be a lawyer. Yeah, uh, so I just want to point out as we're discussing these scenes that um, her husband and manager, Su- Suzanne Summers, husband and manager, are the executive producers on this film. <sighs> So these are the guys that put her in this movie. Yeah. Well, they would have to be because they were probably going. Who else would she do this for? Yeah. He's like, it was probably like, we need to get you out of this movie. He's like, what if we make you an EP? 
I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Sutherland makes a point about how he wishes he had those pictures of the baby seal. He's like, you know what I should have done before I came out here to make a case about the baby seals? I should have brought like any evidence at all that that happened. Yeah. And she's like, well, you know, I could probably get those pictures blown up for you. Or and bring the frigging film. Yeah, the film you would be film. actually more useful. That was pretty terrifying for me. And, uh, and she decides she's going to call her ex that she said lives in Philadelphia. And she's going to have him blow up these pictures for him because he works for some photo place. Mm-hmm. And so she calls him in the middle of the night and is really flirty with him. And then when she hangs up, she's like, oh, no, I forgot. I'm just using my pussy to get things. And this isn't how I'm supposed to do it. So, oh, I guess I just better be a lawyer. And he's like, no, 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 it's fine. You can whore it up. Just help me save some seals. And she's like, oh, thank you. And then uh, every that's another thing that bothers me. Every Every time she's on the phone or anyone's on the phone, they're constantly repeating what the person on the other side of the phone is saying so that we know the whole conversation. How else would we know? Well, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, just say you're half of it and we'll figure out what it, but she's like, oh yeah, no, yep, we were in a relationship. Oh wow, it's still a record for you, is it? Oh, that's interesting. And it's like, uh, you didn't need to repeat everything that he says and he's confused why you're doing that. That would be a really weird conversation to have with someone where they're just repeating everything you say. They get to the hotel the next day, and right before the stockholder meeting, a car pulls up with these massive pictures in the back of it. Mm. And her her ex-boyfriend is helping her take the pictures out. Her ex-boyfriend being Eugene Levy. Yeah. I totally missed that. Yeah. yeah. He's the guy playing her ex-boyfriend. Um, which is funny because him and Catherine O'Hara are husband and wife on, on Schitt's Creek. Um, and both Canadian. Right. And well, there's a, the reason why is because the director... Uh, directed a lot of SCTV, and mm. so he put a bunch of SCTV people in here. There's another couple that we haven't gotten into yet, but uh, they take all these pictures in, and Roger gives this like impassioned presentation to all the stockholders. He basically turns them all around, including this this bizarre character named Henry or Francis. Yeah, um, there's like this older gentleman that's standing next to Roger, and he's like, "Oh wow, this is great. Yeah, I I'm, I make a motion that we should save the seals." And he's like, thank you, Francis. And he's like, oh, I'm not Francis. Francis is my wife. I, I lost my name tag. She's shopping today. It's like, what, Wait, what? is happening? Yeah, well, cause, cause <laughs> Why? Because he, he's almost upset about it. He's like, my name's not Francis. I'm Henry. My wife is Francis. I'm wearing her badge because I lost mine. And she had to go shopping today. Yeah. Like, he's getting like, like, more and more flustered yeah, about it's his just story. It's words not, that didn't need to be in yeah, this scene. Not funny. And I wish this movie would be over sooner. They were just like, can you can you talk more because we need more Canadians with lines? And he's like, I, I guess I can. I don't know why my character would talk here. Yeah, neither do we. Anyway, action. But it doesn't matter that all of the stockholders vote that they're going to put the plan on hold because one stockholder has a majority more stake. shares. Yeah. Well, yeah, he has the proxy shares. Yeah. So he, he's the representative for people who aren't at the meeting and he is voting for them. Yes. And they have decided that they are going to move ahead with the plan. So they get on a train to go home. Or no, they get on the train to Washington. Um, and Abby tells Roger that he cannot quit. And she follows him to his hotel room. As they're walking up the stairs, uh, Paxton sees them. And he says, oh, this is my attorney. And then Paxton, for no reason, it's none of his business. This guy paid for a hotel room. He says, I want to believe you. But why? I don't understand that. Because he you're knows... a hotel person that owns a hotel, and this is a a person that rented a room and brought a woman up. But I think the implication was that they're going to have sex, right? <laughs> yes, we but know. But why that. does Paxton <laughs> care? Well, Paxton doesn't care. This is what what part about Paxton? Then why does he want to believe him? Because Paxton's character is that he's very forthcoming. He doesn't want humans to reproduce. No, he just <laughs> wants people to be honest and pay attention. And so, so when he says, "I want to believe you," he's just mad that he's getting lied to. Yeah, because then he yells about them about it the next morning. He says, "Why wouldn't you he lie just say, me? I believe you'? <laughs> what he says, I want to,' because he's saying you're lying already. It's like I want to believe that that's true, 
and then but he why does. does he want to believe it's that? just a stupid stupid line read <laughs> it's not even it's, he shouldn't be saying i want to believe i'm not justifying it I'm I don't just believe explaining you why it's funny. No, but it's the, not the, funny. But no, saying, but I'm this movie's terrible. Let's funny. move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see your first mistake is you're trying to explain why something that isn't funny is funny. Exactly. But the fact that he says, "I want to believe you," oh my god, please stop! Please stop! He please wants stop. this to be the truth. Yes. But he shouldn't care because he's a guy who rents rooms to people to have sex in. <laughs> <laughs> That's what hotels are for. I don't know if you knew that, listeners. But yeah, he says that Peter calls Roger from the school. Peter is the student that brought the clubbing of the seals to uh, Roger's attention. And and Roger says, what's that? You put my face on every telephone pole in Juno? Oh, yeah. No, I don't mind being a hero. No, I'm not surprised at the, the support you get from the town at all. Oh, you want to have a parade in my honor? And it's just the most yeah. obnoxious, dumb well, phone call technique. I just want to point out that there's a lot of times that you paraphrase things in this in, is in, not... in like an ironic way or like a, a joking way. No, no, no. That is exactly what he sounded like and exactly what he said. My face on every telephone pole in Juno. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, I know. yeah, I, I'm sure I don't mind being a hero. And it's so <laughs> frustrating to listen to. Then we get the moment where I almost turned this movie off, or did turn the movie off a couple times. Uh, Roger and Abby, once he gets off the phone, she says, see, I told you you couldn't quit and uh, leave those poor seals to die. And then he just rubs his mustache all over her face for like 45 seconds, and it was driving me insane. And they're talking about nothing. They're not furthering the plot at all. They're, and they're not kissing even. They're just touching their faces together, and he's just smashing his face all over her face. And that's how you kiss in Alaska. <laughs> oh, is that, is that? Are they doing Eskimo kisses or something? <laughs> anyway, it's, it's gross and weird what they're doing, and they keep doing it for a really long time. And I couldn't stand watching it and the weird little whisper talk that they're doing to each other. And then they have sex, and then we cut to the next morning after they've had sex. And the bathtub is running over again because she didn't get the note that was in the medicine cabinet either. And so Paxton arrives to fix it because presumably it's dripping into the first floor. Right. And so he's already there to fix it. And he's like, I, I told you what to do and you lied to me. And how dare you have sex in the room that you paid for? And uh, Roger's trying to hide her from Paxton. He's like, get under the bed. I don't want Paxton to know that I have sex with ladies. <laughs> and uh, And she's like... Roger, this is 1980. This is ridiculous. Roger, this is 1980. After earlier in the film, two days earlier, she said, this is 1979. Nobody wears underwear anymore, and I'm so horny for you, client. Don't, don't you remember when they had New Year's? Wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> so far, we've said in order, it is 1979, and then it is 1980. Nobody watched this movie before they put it in theaters. They cut it, they put it in theaters, and then they watched it. Roger is embarrassed about Abby in front of Paxton. They go to a library and they read a bunch of dumb, wacky laws like you would in like a children's magazine about things that aren't real. Like um, highlights. Yeah. <laughs> they're, re they're researching Highlights magazine in the library instead of <laughs> saving seals. Then they have more sex. And uh, she says... It's against the law to do what we just did in 37 states, Puerto Rico, and the Panama Canal Zone. Which is the second, I believe, butt sex joke of the movie, if we're keeping track. Unless they're brother and sister or different races. I don't know yeah. what they could have been implying here other than sodomy, right? It's also the tagline on the poster. Is the tagline, they like butt sex and they're saving <laughs> seals. <laughs> yeah, the tagline is... Donald Sutherland and Suzanne Summers break the law in 37 states, Puerto Rico, and the Panama Canal Zone. I didn't know that I could hate this movie more. And then before you read that, Roger's mad that she keeps saying just, you're welcome. Just, just for the record, I just want to say that I just Googled when sodomy laws were repealed. And it wasn't until like 2003 that most of these laws yeah. were deemed no, unconstitutional. I'm, I'm almost certain that's what they're talking about here. Because I don't know what else they could possibly mean. Is it legal still in the Panama Canal Zone? <laughs> Unless, is she making a reference to prostitution laws? Because 
he's just paying her to have sex with her and she's oh, no, not being but an he's attorney? not paying but he has to say he is if somebody asks oh that's right okay <laughs> that's a the, the poop you... hole loophole <laughs> <laughs> makes a lot of sense okay i want people to know that i'm an expensive prostitute so you tell everybody you pay me a bunch those are my favorite prostitutes it's like yeah. you don't have to pay me just say that you did it's like got it <laughs> <laughs> Here is where Roger explains how angry he is that she keeps saying you're welcome after they have sex. And he says, I mean, it's 1979. You can admit that you get as much pleasure out of it as I do. What is it with this? <laughs> Why? Why did we say it was 1979 and then say it was 1980 and then say it was 1979? You, these characters didn't have to mention the year so constantly. You know, parts of Alaska extend beyond the international <laughs> okay, so zone. Now we're moving over the time <laughs> this zone. This time zone is really long. <laughs> really long. Maybe they, they broke the, the laws of physics in 37 states. <laughs> Someone watched this movie and heard them say all three of those lines and was just like, meh, who's listening to what the characters say? Suzanne um, Summers is on the screen. No one's paying attention yeah. to what she's saying. So Abby goes to the library and finds this treaty with the Manitoba Indians. And with the help of a librarian, she learns that all but one, there, there were 230 that were moved to a reservation after conflicts over this particular land area. That they have a contractual right to. Mm -hmm. um, all but one of them were killed. Are they all... Like 230 Manitoba Indians were moved to a reservation and one escaped. Yeah. Which to me implies a genocide situation. 229 of them did not escape and are no longer with us. That means they were killed, right? They don't say it. They don't se. say that. But or, or they're just all... Dead. But the and fact they were that, all infertile. But None the of fact them... that the one that is missing is essentially in hiding seems to mean that... Is he? Yes. I think okay. he is in hiding because they make a big deal when they go to find him that he's like nowhere to be found. I thought it was just hard to find a person. No, he's, he is like... That's why they have to go through all these steps because he's super paranoid about being discovered. Well, Because he's living in fear. There's all kinds of problems with that then. Um, but so 230 Manitoba Indians were moved to reservation. 229 of them were killed and one escaped in 1922. And if you're keeping track, this is 1979 or, or 1980, 1980 or 1979. <laughs> so he's going to be at least 58 years old if he escaped when he was zero. Yeah. So he's I'm probably he's in his late 60s, early 70s, probably. <laughs> um, this Abby, was his final film. Right. Yes. Um, Abby calls another boyfriend to book Roger as a talk show guest. And the new plan is that they'll go on a talk show and invite the last unkilled Manitoba Indian to out himself to them so that they can not kill him, wink, wink. And save seals. Yeah, and save seals. So um, what's more important, last surviving Manitoba Indian, your life or the life of these seals yeah. that you don't know about? So we get... This comedian on a talk show, <laughs> it's, a, it's a drag comedian whose jokes aren't very funny, and they never shoot the stage wide, so it's just these weird close-ups of people's faces. Yeah. Um, it doesn't convey the shape of the room very well at all, but so this comedian does the end of a bad stand-up routine, and then sits down, and then the host says, oh, this is Roger Keller, and then the comedian says, oh, any relationship to Helen? Uh, that's who choreographed my act. And then the unibrow Carl Sagan host guy uh, just repeats her joke and mm -hmm. says, oh, yeah, it looked like it. And then the whole audience cracks up when the host says the same dumb joke. And then he says, no, 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 I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Like he's like really worried about offending this comedian with his or her own joke. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, was this was this a drag queen? Or yes. Was, yes. Okay. I wasn't clear if it was just an ugly lady or a drag queen. No. Okay. Uh, Definitely a man. Yes. Uh, a semi-celebrity character. So, uh, and the, the comedian keeps making jokes as uh, he or she, um, I'm not sure the, the preference, keeps making jokes about the seals getting clubbed and says, oh, they only mate once? What a drag. And then the host says, for you maybe, Craig, but the seals are quite content. Um, because Craig is the actual name of this performer. Dunbar's president hires someone to blackmail 
the Suzanne Summers character. Yeah, basically. they're going to start taking photos and following them around. We'll get onto it right away. We'll set up the camera in the girl's apartment. Then we'll bug no, them. No, no, no. Don't tell me. I don't want to hear about it. Just, uh, just do it. Because and they don't say what show this is, uh, if it's like a local talk show or if it's a nationwide late night talk show. Yeah. But um, the guy that's hosting the show, like, filled in for Carson, like, 130 times. Yeah. So it's possible that the implication is supposed to be that this is literally the Tonight Show. Um, but they're so tight on everybody the whole time that we never get a feel for the stage and understand right, right. where they are. Um, but uh, so Dunbar is very upset about this PR, which if they were actually upset about the PR... They never would have let this story go on television right. because the show even admits, oh, we called them in advance for for their defense. And they said, oh, no, we're fixing it and we're taking care of everything. What they would have said is, you don't put that person on your show or we're pulling, we're pulling all of our advertising forever. Yeah. So don't put them on your show. And they never would have booked Donald Sutherland as a guest. But they do. They do and Dunbar hires uh, basically like a PI to follow them around. Yeah. And uh, he also does what he should have done at the very beginning and says hire a crap load more clubbers and get rid of the rest of those seals so this isn't a problem yeah like seriously by the time he got to the investor meeting you said there's only like 300 left yeah so over the course of a few days we've killed 600 of 600 them. of them 700 seven yeah okay yes exactly 700 of them so you could totally in another day kill the last 300 yeah we, or just double up or just get i could a lot kill more 300 there. seals in a day also just i've <laughs> seen you do it <laughs> it's like you're you're in cahoots with the u.s military just firebomb them like why are you wasting your time with clubs this is caveman technology <laughs> there's, there's a funny moment here though the president hires this pi guy and he sends them on their way and as they're walking out the front door he's like waving to his child in his wife's arms Mm -hmm. and he's like hey buddy i love you so much like waving at the kid and then when dabney coleman walks between them he's like oh hello hi like thinks he's waving at him and the president says i'm not waving at you idiot yeah but that that moment cracked me up Uh, dabney coleman is great in this dabney coleman i mean dabney coleman always plays a very similar character you can have paxton i think dabney is the best person (laughs) Um, i i I do love dabney coleman I, i can't stress that enough yes uh, Roger and Abby don't understand why uh, the Manitoba Indian who escaped genocide isn't rushing to reveal himself. Um, then they get a phone call from what is it, Canuck or something like yeah, that? Yeah, Canuck, which is uh, which is a he, term for Canadian. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, he says he's the last Manitoba Indian, um, and they can come and talk to him. They go and meet him, and he's like thirty something or forty something. So yeah, yeah. obviously not the person they're looking for. But they sit down with him, and they get all this information. And he says that he's related to who did it, like uh, Sitting Bull or somebody Crazy or, Horse or something. Yeah, like that. it's some famous Native American, and he's like, "Well, I thought he was Comanche." Geronimo, maybe. Geronimo, there you go. And uh, and he says that he's also related to Jim Thorpe, and he's like, "Well, hold on a minute, like none of this is checking out." And then the TV, which has been on this whole time, cuts to a commercial break, and we're getting a commercial for Perrier water. Yeah. And someone's talking in a bad French accent about Perrier water. And they look over at the TV and notice that it's the same guy who is sitting in front of them pretending to be a Native American. Yeah. I was almost wondering if the baseball game, because Donald Sutherland glances over at the baseball game and looks back at him, and was wondering if it was supposed to be a Redskins game. And, oh. and, and like the whole thing is like, why would he be watching a Redskins yeah. game? That seems inappropriate. But yeah, so it turns out this guy's fake. He was hired by the Dunbar people to pretend to be the Manitoba Indian to throw them off um, their trail. Then another really weird... A scene I would have cut completely out of the movie. Roger, one of many scenes I would cut. I would, I would have just cut them all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Roger and Abby driving home, stop at a gas station. And Roger hands over his credit card to this full service station. And they come out to the car and they say, your card was declined. Uh, it says that it's stolen. Um, and he says, well, that's impossible. Run it again. And... Abby is saying like, "Oh wow, they're they're really pulling out all the stops to to interrupt our investigation." It's like we're not we're not investigators. You're an attorney. I'm a professor. What are we doing? What what are we yeah. doing? Why are we trying to find this person? Um, but the guy from the gas station comes back and he says, "Oh, you're right. I ran it again, and everything's fine. Come get him, police!" And these police pull up, 
and Donald Sutherland just drives away with the pump still in the car. So he tears it, it off of the the pump. And we get an innocent gasoline fight accident. Yeah, there's <laughs> <laughs> the gas is just getting thrown all over everybody, I, I do including the, the police. Yeah, I do love the one guy shout, "Stop that gas! It's a dollar eighty a gallon." <laughs> yeah. But there's also, at every gas station, there's like a switch on the wall that you can pull that's an emergency yeah. shutoff. But nobody's going for it. They're just holding this tube and spraying gas all over each other. But now the cops and both gas station employees are completely doused in gasoline. I can't see! Oh. I can't see either! This gasoline's all over me! Are they following us? And Abby and Roger are driving full speed away in a, in a full-on high-speed chase. Yeah. And they're driving upstairs and around statues. Well, but then also, there's nowhere... Parks. There's no way these cops would be able to pursue them right. with gasoline in their eyes. Yeah, they can't breathe. They can't see. The guy in the passenger seat in the police car is Joe Flaherty, another SCTV <laughs> alum. Um, jerk ass. Jerk ass. <laughs> the guy from Happy Gilmore yeah, that yeah. keeps shouting that. Yeah, so they keep getting chased until it seems like Roger loses them, but also loses the car because he drives it into the river. into the river, and then the two of them just get out and cut their losses and go okay well that bug's gone um for a second it floats though in the water and she's like oh wow they do float which must have been a part of an advertising campaign for yeah. vw bugs at some point um i do like the scene where they're sitting in front of the the, the jefferson memorial and donald Sutherland keeps trying to light a joint but yeah because soaking wet and he just throws the matchbook away and goes you wouldn't happen to have a light and suzanne summers actually genuinely, genuinely laughs. laughs and i'm wondering if he was supposed to, to light the joint yeah and he just couldn't do it and just like was just fed up yeah. with what was happening. <laughs> but uh, but it, the reveal there is that he literally got into a high-speed chase and drove their car into a river to avoid getting arrested for uh, possession of marijuana. Mm-hmm. Yep. Th- that's the, the whole point of the scene. Well, we, we, we skipped over a little bit before where they they're, they're running into issues. Um, she's got her her. She just had her driver's license suspended, right? Because for a faulty car that she no longer owns, yeah, she's being audited. They had the phone lines cut to her office, uh, and now they've got the her credit the credit card canceled. So they're starting to worry that this is th- bigger than they expected. Yeah, and I think Donald Sutherland was thinking, "Oh God, if the police catch me with this, they'll lock us up long enough for them." Like it's the 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 uh you know the not the Lafleur but the Lafleur's scene in uh Mallrats, Mallrats is like yeah. it'll be enough to lock us up for the duration of the show isn't that right Lafleur yeah <laughs> uh uh so I think that that was his concern yeah but he ends up um committing hundreds of felonies along the way and they would for sure be in jail at the end of this let's say ditch the evidence. But, but by way of draining the car but they left he left his id and his and his credit card with the gas station so they know who he is and they know that he no they know that the cart's stolen oh okay so he would say oh that's not me if the card was stolen yeah okay interesting interesting strategy <laughs> flawless movie you guys <laughs> okay i take it back this movie's brilliant um but yeah so they go back to the hotel and Paxton is like, oh, the cops came and went through your room. And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. At least it wasn't them shutting down the building. And he's like, well, then the fire department came later in the day and they're they're taking the, they're shutting down the building. They're evicting everybody. And he's like, oh, well, I'm really sorry about that. And he's like, it's okay. I need a partner and I'm you're going to be my partner and we're going to yeah. fight this now, now that I'm homeless. Now that you made me homeless, you jerk. And so they're best friends, and and Paxton's on on their team now. Dabney uh, pulls over and gets their attention as they're walking down the sidewalk, and he says, "Hey, we need to talk. I think I have something great that's going to make everybody happy." And they go to uh, the head of the construction company's office, and they give him a big stack of pictures of them having sex, mm-hmm. and, and and more more than likely Blake breaking that law, that yeah. thirty seven state yes. law. So we have footage of you two um, having sex in a way that's illegal. And uh, so you're going to go to jail for sodomy and stealing a car. But you couldn't have stolen the car because someone else stole it before you stole it. Yeah. And they take a moment and they take the pictures in the other room. And then 
they have a private conversation and they come back and they say we've made a decision we'd like two copies of that a blow up of that four two just two of that and one of that for my mother we don't care we're two consenting adults and mm-hmm. go ahead and take us to court for this this is dumb so the blackmail basically just 100 percent failed they decide not to move forward with uh, showing the court that these people co- or, had or, an illegal sex, or do they? Because we don't know anything about what's right. happening in this movie. Either way, the movie <laughs> drops that thread and never picks it up again. They get a call from an older woman who says she knows the Indian, um, and she comes to their office to give them information. But they're worried that the office is completely bugged, mm-hmm. so they tell her to write it down on a piece of paper. I don't know what she's writing down. Yeah. She doesn't give them any information here. Yeah. Other but, than I know the Indians. And then we come up with a like incredibly convoluted plan. Yeah. yeah. That makes no sense. And doesn't work. Yeah. It, <laughs> it fails immediately. Um, but so they ask her to write down something. I don't know what they ask her to write down because she doesn't tell them where the Native American is. And then she leaves. So they have this nonsense plan where they're like, okay, we got to do something to distract the PI because they're following us everywhere. So here's what we're going to do. Abby, you're going to pretend that you have like appendicitis um, and that you're going to the hospital. I have a friend who's a doctor and he's going to smuggle you out of the hospital. So you can hide in the trunk of the car that we're going to be driving. Yes. So you can hide in our car instead of just riding with us. They'll assume that there's only two people in this car instead of three people in this car. Mm -hmm. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to drive to a hotel outside of town. She's going to call that hotel and tell us where to go to meet this Native American character. Mm -hmm. We didn't tell her to just call your office or to call literally anywhere near here. We could all go in the same car. I don't know why you have to be in the trunk. Well, I guess the plan is they get the call. They pretend to go to the location so they get followed. Meanwhile, Suzanne Summers has the real information left in the hotel room, and she's going to go to the real location. Not unbeknownst to her, that Ralston was somehow also following them and yeah. got there without the, his own people knowing. Yeah, he literally just booked a room in a hotel by coincidence, mm-hmm. stood and watched out the window in case anyone climbed out of the trunk to be a third part of their mystery yeah. plan, and saw her get onto a bus. And said, stop following that blue car. They just dropped the girl off here. So follow this bus now. And so they follow the bus to the address where the Native American is waiting in like the top of a barn in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, And and somehow all all these cars get mixed up. Like all of a sudden they get to the the Native American location first. Yeah. And I was like, how, how they, did... Yeah, how well, did they, they did say that, first? oh, well, they stopped for gas, and then we stopped for gas, and then they stopped to pee, and then we stopped to pee. This is getting ridiculous. And it's like, is that your way of explaining why how you switched places? Yeah. It's like, how did you know where to go if you weren't following that car anymore? Weren't you trying to figure out where they were going? Yeah, because they don't know where the barn is because the plan was to get picked up by a red pickup truck. Right. And they don't know where to go from there. Right, but they go straight to the barn. Um and they run up to Suzanne Summers and say, hey, they figured out where you are. They're following everybody now. And let's go up there and talk to this Native American guy. So they run up with a bunch of money that they promised for uh, the Native American and a contract. And they say, here, sign this contract. And he's like, oh, no, I'm a Manitoba Indian. I, I know better than to sign a contract I haven't read. And they're like, just sign it. And he's like, okay. All right, here's the money. Yep, thank you for the money. I'll sign this. I'm, I've learned nothing. And... uh all my people were genocided out of existence for signing contracts they didn't read. And right. This is great. I'm so excited to do this for you guys. And you're not teaching me a lesson about not doing that. You don't stop and go, oh, geez, you're right. That was terrible. Take your time. Read the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so now Ralston, Dickerson, and Jake, the PI, are outside. And they're going to get ready to burn the barn down. Yeah. They're like, oh, this is perfect. They're all in the same place. We can just murder them. I, I feel like... They, I don't know if it, I don't even even classify it as a red herring. Where Dickerson, when they have the photos, he he steps away and goes, "I don't like this." You know, I kind of like those kids, and like this feels like they're messed up, and I don't agree with what they're doing. Yeah. But I don't want to do this. Yeah. So I thought Dabney Coleman was being groomed for a character change or a change of heart. Oh, okay. And that this this was going to be the final straw. He wasn't going to go through with it. Yeah. Uh. 
But nope, he's super into it. And in fact, he says, <laughs> this is just like high school. And I was like, How many people what? did Remember that you time murder in they, high school? They hired me to burn down that Indian camp in Alaska in high school. <laughs> Man, I got paid so much. Anyway. Got, so paid, he's like, got paid in seal clubbing. What? Yeah. So they, uh, they take the gas. They siphon the gas out of both cars that are here. Not just one car. Both of the cars. Mm-hmm. And they light this barn on fire. Um, oh, by the way, we, we skipped another butt sex joke. I feel like we should go back to it. But um, when they're driving around with Suzanne Summers in the trunk, she keeps saying that she's in pain. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. Is your head okay? And she said, it's not my head I'm worried about. And then when she gets out of the car, she's like, Jesus, now I know what it feels like to be gang banged by the L.A. Rams. <laughs> so it's like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Who wrote this and why? So that's, I think, four or five on the, on the butt sex tally. Also, she agreed to say those lines. So she's also responsible. Yeah. No, I wasn't trying to excuse her at all. Okay. And the other rounds are a team again. Hey. Yay. Thank God. Um, we can make jokes like this in our movies now. Yeah. But yeah, so they, they light the barn on fire. And they're like, okay, you got to sign this contract right away. He signs all the pages of the contract. Donald Sutherland jumps out the window into a pile of hay on the side of the barn. And runs out to their car which apparently they left enough gas in for him to drive when when he's about to jump out though he's like stay here yeah like yeah. it's just such a look, this barn is on fire i'm not gonna wait for you to to rescue yeah. us i'm well, not gonna stay here if you can jump out we can all jump out yeah but i think that instruction specifically was don't climb down because i'm about to drive through the side of this barn and i don't want to hit you guys but yes. still, it would have made more sense for everybody to jump out the same window that he did and run to the car. But he drives the car through the side of the flaming barn and says, all right, everybody get in. Jump jump in the back and get low down because he thinks they're going to start shooting at the car probably. Right. And he backs out of the hole he just punched in the side of the barn and someone's there with a gun. And so he's like, all right, I guess we're going the other way. And he drives back through the flaming barn, through a wall, and just off a ramp. Yeah. Um, and just crashes the car hard on the other side of the ramp. Um. But they get away, and Dabney Coleman and the other murderers go back to their car, and they're like, oh, well, this car is completely out of gas. I should have taken more from the other car. Yeah. Because that's the one that we didn't have the keys to. And uh, and that's where we end the scene, basically. Like, oh, uh, we screwed up murdering those people because we left them enough gas to escape. Yep. So the next day, they've just given up on their whole plan and they're like all right well we're gonna build the base in a different place now well they, they stopped the seal killing right that there's a That's quick true. Yes. quick quick button of that yeah we get a, a quick shot of a bunch of people losing their jobs um and then uh we go back to dunbar construction headquarters where they're saying okay here's where we're gonna do it now and there's only one problem polar bears but we can kill them with poison darts arsenic yeah. it's completely painless and it'll be great and then the door opens up and these wax statues of Roger and Abby are just standing there staring at them like a couple of creepers. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'm assuming they're there to hand them warrants for their arrest for attempted murder. I think it's someone dressed up to look like them because they would obviously also already be in jail for all the illegal things they've done. Like driving a car around the city and destroying it and then ditching it in the river. And then having sex in illegal ways. But, yeah, this shot is so weird of them just standing there in the doorway, not saying anything, just posed behind each other like they're Charlie's Angels. Well, yeah, when when you when you pose and go out on, on, on a shot like of the two of them, that's what makes this like a jaunty romantic comedy. But it's just like, oh, these guys are going to threaten to sue us again. It's like, no, no, no. You tried to murder us yesterday. We broke lots of laws. Let's all go to jail. <laughs> end of movie. And that's that's where it ends. That's yeah. the end of this film. Thank God. Yeah, it was a... Like, I could almost see a movie here. Until this... Like, I was like, this movie's pretty bad. But, you know, if justice is served and the seals are saved and people go to jail... But it doesn't happen. Nobody goes to jail. It just It's a movie just ends. There needed to be at least five more minutes of, you guys are going to jail. Yeah. Because you tried to kill us. Is nothing going to happen? Apparently not. Nope. 
they're gonna they're gonna be slightly further away from stopping this missile base because uh, they just have like, to build the community further north, and they're gonna kill some other endangered species. It it does seem like they're it's just bygones. They're just letting bygones be bygones, and they're like. Okay, we'll do the base somewhere else then. Fine, you guys can live and we'll go somewhere else. And uh, and they're like, oh, 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 we're going to challenge that legally. It's like, you didn't do that last time. You didn't challenge us legally at all. You didn't file a single injunction. Like, nope. you could have stopped what was happening and you instead chose to do a bunch of weird detective work behind the scenes and not save anything. This movie's dumb. <laughs> It was directed by George Bloomfield, who, as I said before, uh, directed some SCTV, which explains the appearances of Catherine O'Hara, Eugene Levy, Joe Flaherty, and Tony Rosado was a character in there. I didn't mention. I don't remember the character he played. Um, uh, George Bloomfield also directed a Canadian thriller called Deadly Companion, a.k.a. Double Negative, with John Candy, Joe Flaherty, Eugene Levy, Catherine O'Hara, and Dave Thomas. Um that cool. sounds like a thriller. Yeah, it's a thriller. It, it's all dramatic roles. Um, and according to Wikipedia, only O'Hara has more than one scene of all those people. And yet the poster on the Wikipedia article is literally just a split screen of John Candy on one side and Tony Perkins on the other side. And it makes it look like John Candy is like the second lead of the film. But none of the SCTV members is actually billed higher than 11th. It also came out in 1980, but luckily it never got an American release, so we'll never watch it, and it's that's the end of the story of that film. Yeah. And he looks like he also directed a <laughs> Tech War movie. Tech War? Yeah, you don't remember Tech War? Nope. Oh, man. Tech War. <laughs> I got my brain wiped after the Tech War. I don't remember. It was too brutal. Well, it was a thing. <laughs> the sci-fi it's a documentary. Series. It's, a, it's a crazy, weird sci-fi series. All right. Um, writer Robert Kaufman also wrote Freebie and the Bean and Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine. <laughs> Have you ever heard of that movie? No. They used to play that trailer at the New Beverly all the time. It's Vincent Price plays Dr. Goldfoot in the oh. Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine. There, there's more than one Dr. Goldfoot movie. Uh, and like I said before, he also played the professor in the first scene. Um, and I don't have it here, but I think he wrote another movie... That comes out later this year, the How to Beat the High Cost of Living. I'm pretty sure he also wrote that. Donald Sutherland played Roger Keller here. Uh, like we said in our MASH review, he did a lot of war stuff to start out. Um, in the 70s, he did like Clute and Day of the Locust. And uh, he represents uh, some of the Canadian points that this film had to score to get whatever tax relief that it was looking for. Suzanne Summers plays Abigail Adams, obviously, Three's Company. Um, this was her first film, uh, first major film, and her last one before 1994 in Serial Mom. Um, she also played Carol Lambert on Step by Step, uh, which, as we all know, was inspired, or uh, went on to inspire every song in Scott Stapp's entire discography. Um, Roscoe Lee Brown plays Paxton. He was also Box in Logan's Run. Uh, he's the voice of Francis in Oliver and Company. Um, he's the voice of Big Ed Zettimore in The Real Ghostbusters, which is uh, Winston's father. Yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, and he also did Kingpin's voice in the Spider-Man anime. Yeah, which series. is the big one that I... I, um, I also remember him in Jumbo Jack Flash, but he only has like one or two scenes. Yeah. Dabney Coleman was Dickerson here. Uh, War Games, Cloak and Dagger. Yeah. Uh, 9 to 5 later this year. He's just great. Yeah. I like him a lot. And I really think that he's the most believable character in every scene of this movie. Um, everybody else is like just playing weird caricatures, but he feels like, I mean, Dabney Coleman's always kind of playing himself a little bit. Yeah. Um, but he, he, he's always trying, you know? Mm. Um, Ooh, do we actually, Oh, we do night. Cause I love nine to five. We actually yeah. get that later this That'll year. That'll be in December. Yeah. Oh, how exciting. That's awesome. Um, Chief Dan George was Oscar, the, the lost Manitoba Indian. Um, he played old lodge skins in little big man he played Lone Waity in Outlaw Josie Wales. Yeah, probably his most like, yeah. notable. Um, and he was also uh, Sam Two Feathers in Harry and Tonto. Uh, John Denner played the senator. Uh, he was Henry Luce in The Right Stuff. He was Wallinger in Day of the Dolphin, which we talked about when the dolphins were trained to kill the president. Yep. Uh, and he also plays a commissioner in Airplane 2. 
David Steinberg was the talk show host, um, who I said before he guest hosted Carson 130 times. Um, he was a big TV director. He hosts a show called Inside Comedy on Showtime right now. Okay. Uh, or maybe it recently ended. And uh, he also hosted his own variety show that starred John Candy, Joe Flaherty, Martin Short, and Dave Thomas. Craig Russell was the talk show guest that was the, the famous female impersonator. Uh, more Canada points. And uh, Craig died of AIDS in 1990 at 42, which seems to be happening more and more as we're going through these casts. Um, Catherine O'Hara was Audrey here. People know her from Home Alone probably first or the Christopher Guest movies. And uh, she was also obviously Sally in uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. And Miss, you know, Deets. Oh, yes. Deets and Beetlejuice. And uh, Michael Wincott was Peter. That's the sweaty kid that noticed that seals were getting smashed. (laughs) Um, He's the voice of Scroop in Treasure Planet. (laughs) Oh, yeah, of course. Scroop. <laughs> I have no idea who Scroop is, but I just thought that's Well, funny. but I think Roscoe Lee Brown uh, played Mr. Arrow. Yes, that's right. There yeah. was there were two credits from that movie. Um, he, uh, Michael Wincott, the sweaty kid, also played Elgin in Alien Resurrection. Um, hmm. Don't remember that character because yeah. I haven't seen that movie since I saw it in theaters. Uh, Maury Chaikin played Canuck. Uh, he was Jim Sting in War Games with Dabney Coleman. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also plays... Uh, I always think of this character. He played a Ernest in Bartleby. Did you ever see Bartleby? No. It's a Crispin Glover movie. Oh. Um, it's like an adaptation of uh, Herman Melville's story, but it has uh, David Paymer is like the boss of this office. Mm-hmm. And he's trying to fire Crispin Glover. And he says, like, you're fired. Get out of the office. And he says, I, I don't think I would like to do that. Or like, he's like being weirdly like passive resistance every time yeah, they yeah. tell him to leave. And he's like, I'm not sure that I would like to do that. Or he, they won't even fire him. Like they just ask him to do something and he says he doesn't want to do it. Um, but he doesn't leave and he keeps coming to work and they can't get rid of him, but it's driving everybody crazy. <laughs> they should just keep moving his desk until it's down in the basement well, and it, take the, his red stapler away. It's a very small <laughs> office, um, but it's an interesting movie. The cast is really funny. Um, Joe Flaherty, we mentioned before is uh, patrol car policeman. Number two, he's the guy <laughs> who keeps saying jackass and happy Gilmore. Uh, He's also the voice of Abe's foster dad on Clone High. Um, he was the dad on Freaks and Geeks. Yeah, uh, he was the Western Union telegram in Back to the Future. In Back to the Future. Yeah, the guy is that in the first one or the second? One? The second one. Like, yeah, I have something for you. A letter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, he's also a death row inmate in Johnny Dangerously. He's the border guard in Stripes when they're going in and out oh, of the yeah, yeah. country. Uh, yeah, and the and the they keep destroying like the the border security gate like they drive through the gate and then they drive through the actual guard shack and uh he'll appear later this year in used cars um and then we had eugene levy as marty who i think most people will go to american pie yeah Um, but he's also in basically every christopher guest movie yeah he's the voice of dory's father in uh, finding dory um i really like him as vic in multiplicity Mm. The like incompetent coworker of Michael Keaton at the beginning, they're like destroying the wrong driveway when they're they're like they showed up like a few hours late. He's like, oh, I got, he's like wearing multiple watches yeah. and he showed up at the wrong time. Uh, he he uh, and John Candy are in a fun buddy movie called Armed and Dangerous. Oh yes, with yeah. Meg Ryan. Um, and he also has a show right now with Catherine O'Hara called Shit's Creek that has been running for a bunch of seasons, and I haven't watched any of it, but it's all on Netflix. And I hear it's funny all the time, and I still don't watch it. Um, so that's my bad. I'm a bad person. Yeah, it's not like you're watching every movie that came out in 1980 or anything. Yeah, that's not happening for sure. That'd be weird. Up or down, Jess? Oh, it's a big down. That's, yeah, it's pretty It's pretty terrible. It's it's one of the, one of the more rougher ones we've watched, I feel. Yeah. It this might is... even be the most roughest one. <gasps> uh oh. Come well, up on I'm going to give this a thumbs down. Thumbs down. Yeah. yeah. Jess, where's this on your letterbox? Yeah, it's the, it's the most worst. It's the bottom of mine, too. Um, I have it up a couple <laughs> from the bottom. Uh, it if is you put below... this above Forbidden Zone, it... I'm going to be real angry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is below the windows threshold. Uh, it is below. Just tell me what you want. 
What is it above? It's above Forbidden Zone, and it's above Don't Answer the Phone. Yeah. No. <laughs> I, I'd rather watch it than either of those two No, movies. you wouldn't. That's not true. You're not being honest with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. You can put it where you want in your list. You'll move it later. <laughs> <laughs> I have control over the list, so I can change it however I like. No, uh, this is going on the bottom for me. This is this was the hardest for me to finish so far, and you can attest to it. I don't know if it was just I was tired or hungry or what. I was so so angry watching I w- this movie. I, w- I was certain that you were going to give up on this entire podcast. I considered and, it and and apologize profusely to Richard for wasting so much of his time. Yes, <laughs> um, I was real mad. I feel like this might not even be the worst for the year. We're going to have something oh, that makes yeah. me it, angrier than this. This, there's, it, this list is going to get crazy. And by the way, in our MASH review, we said, oh, it's crazy that Kiefer Sutherland came out of this guy. It's not that crazy anymore. He's, <laughs> he's not charismatic at all in this movie. He's very boring the whole time. And it's like, I thought Donald Sutherland was always entertaining. No, no. Turns out he can suck just like everybody else. Yeah, this was a bad one. And I'm mad. I feel like we should talk about the thresholds for which we, like, I know we're saying we're watching every movie from 1980, but are we watching every domestic movie? This is a Canadian movie. Like, maybe we should never have even watched this movie. It had an American release. So anything that has an American release, we're watching. A wide American release. A wide American release. That's that's the basic threshold that I was starting with, Um, which is why, as far as foreign films go, the only ones we've covered have been a couple Australian movies and a couple Canadian movies that actually got wide releases in America. Well, and I and I get it for any film that was nominated for some sort of Academy Award. Sure. That so like you know for for instance my brilliant career. Right. You know I'm 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 cool with that. But and like, Mad Max isn't obvious. And Mad Max and and I'm okay with cult films. So we did. Mad Max, which I think falls into that category, and mm-hmm. we did Forbidden Zone, which falls into that category. Right, because it was this very, very limited. This is release. neither of those. It is not. It, it but was, it got a wide release. It was not nominated, and it was not. It's but it's a foreign film. Right, but it had a wide domestic release. Not most foreign films do not get a wide domestic release. This one did because Suzanne Somers was in it. Uh, all right. I shouldn't have included it. I'll I'll grant you that. This should not have been on the list just because of how angry it made me. Too late. Yeah. It has been but that's what I'm saying. seen by us. Once Richard already sent me the message saying, hey, I watched Nothing Personal. I was like, oh, yeah, we're going to watch that later today. And I was like, halfway through the movie, like, how do I make a time machine? Go back and tell Richard not <laughs> and to watch it. kill this. Richard before he watches it. <laughs> <laughs> I can save so many lives. But yeah, that's that's been the plan so far. We're going to miss movies, too, that got wide releases that are straight up american movies just because you know no list is complete that i'm pulling up and if if you encounter any of those send them to me and maybe we'll cover them on their 41st birthdays but uh we've already got enough movies in 1980 and we can't find some movies yeah there there have been a few that we just have no way of locating and uh we have about 168 to 170 on our schedule for this year including our monthly 70s film um, which is available for Patreon subscribers. And beyond that, I think that that's asking too much of us to review. So if there's anything you feel like we're, we missed, it's possible that we're considering a different release date, like The Visitor, for example. Some people say it came out already uh, in 1980, but we're going by the October release because that's when it got its, uh, or November release, that's when it got its release in the United States. But the release date on IMDb says March or February, but it didn't release in the United States until November. So check the release date if you think we missed something, and it's possible it's just coming up later in the year because we're going by the U.S. release date. But for the most part, I think uh, I think we're going to cover everything you could name off the top of your head. I'd be very surprised. Um, I think we're going to cover everything you could name off the, the bottom, bottom of your head. Of... <laughs> well, the bottom of something. <laughs> Not enough butt jokes in this episode. (laughs) All right. I think that's about it for this one. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, 
Uh, you can also support the show through patreon.com slash vintage video podcast. And I mentioned before, um, our subscribers at the, the $5 a month level have access to our monthly uh, 70s review, which is a movie on its 50th anniversary. And uh, you also have a hand in choosing that the movie for the following month. Um, thank you so much for listening. And I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Serial, which IMDb describes vaguely as it's the end of the 1970s. Hippies are assimilating, women are raising their consciousness, and men are becoming confused and ineffectual. Film critic Vito Russo called it the perfect anti-feminist homophobic statement to usher in the age of Ronald Reagan. Perfect. Oh, God. (laughs) If we didn't have enough films that I was annoyed at already. We now leave you with the trailer (laughs) for Serial. America. Welcome to Marin County, California, where the search for the ultimate lifestyle is the goal of every man. Mark, remember I have a bad back. Hey, Rob! My friends are having a party. Every woman. Very apt, Carol, very apt. He wants me to goof off with him standing in a hammock. And every precocious child. Now, as far as Stokely's concerned, it's just a question of putting him in touch with his childhood. I'm only 10 years old, you dork. Serial, an adult look at the sometimes not-too-adult world of the country's most with-it community. Eunice, meanness, usness, weenness. Sickness. Serial is a new brand of comedy. In an insane society, the same man must appear insane. Where'd you get that? Star Trek. Harvey. Harvey. Serious. Harvey, this is Mark. Hi, I'm uh, Harvey. uh, Wait, I can't. You don't eat it, you see it.